started and then Tim will sort of get this up and running on the YouTube channel. Um, and I'll just people, the um, waiting room is open so people can pop in and out um, as needed. Any, do you need anything from me before we start? Are you all set? No, I'm fine. It's just a matter, I don't know. I, I'm happy to introduce myself so that um, makes it easier. Okay. If you'd like to, I would love to welcome you, though. Just a quick welcome and thank yeah, you sure. so much for, for joining <laughs> us because we are certainly excited to have you here and, and really looking forward to having a conversation with you. So thanks so much. Fantastic. And can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Yep. Great. Coming to you live from my dining room. <laughs> okay. So you ready for me? We are ready. Thank you. Okay, there we go. I will share and get this up. There we go. And collapse that down. All right. Okay, so everyone can everyone see my screen okay and hear me okay? Beautiful. All right. Um, so my name's Felice Jacker. I'm a professor of this is quite a mouthful, nutritional psychiatry and psychiatric epidemiology at Deakin University um, and we sit within the School of Medicine, within a big institute, a, a medical research institute. Um, and my background, so people are clear from the start, I'm not a psychiatrist. My background is in uh, psychology and epidemiology. But of course my team, we have psychologists, we have psychiatrists, we have quite a few dietitians, <laughs> we have um, IT specialists, we have uh, people with backgrounds in computer science who do bioinformatics because when we start dealing with microbiome stuff, that's very, very complex. We pe have people from more general biomedical science backgrounds or um, health, just health research backgrounds. So we have a very broad number of uh, range of disciplines within the team because people often um, contact me to know how they might get into research in this field. And basically it's any sort of health research or something that could be applied to health, such as computer science. Um, and you just have to have very, very good academic grades because to do a PhD, you need the equivalent of 85 out of 100 in a research related top topic, or, you know, thesis um, subject. Uh, but if you have that, then that's sort of your golden ticket to doing research. Research is an incredibly difficult and demanding career because it's so competitive and there's so little money. But if you can survive in it, it is also the most incredible career because it's, it takes you all over the world and you get to uh, learn all the time and to uh, do incredibly fascinating stuff. And, um, you know, I, I love it. I can't imagine doing anything else, but I can't say that it's been an easy ride. It's a very, very challenging um, so that's for all the students. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, come on. Sorry. Okay, so I'm going to put this talk into an important context. And that context is um, unhealthy diet or poor diet is now the leading cause of illness and early death around the world. Um, and if we look, sorry, if we look at the data, we see that... Um, and this is the most recent update of the Large Global Burden of Disease Study, which basically involves more than 180 countries and more than 1,800 researchers where they get all the data from around the world, bring it together and crunch the numbers. And we see that the um, top risks for women and for men are things that are largely related to diet. So high blood pressure, dietary risk, this is the poor diet itself, high fasting glucose, uh, high body mass index and similar in the men as well. Um, and basically what we also know about poor diet is that it arises from these large scale changes to our food systems, what we call the industrialization of the food system. And the latest report tells us that that is costing us trillions and trillions of dollars every year around the globe through cost to health and also costs to the environment. Um, and so that's the context in which we work. Poor diet is the leading contributor to illness and early death around the world. But at the same time, mental and substance use disorders are the leading cause of global disability. And the biggest chunk is depression, depression 
and also anxiety disorders. And these are called the common mental disorders for a very good reason. And they um, create a huge burden on individuals, communities and society through, through costs, through lost opportunity for suffering um, and the flow and effects to all aspects of, of life. The fact that these two things are connected is an incredibly important understanding. So when we think about risk factors for mental disorders, they're very often things that are largely out of our control. They're things like our genetics and family history, early life trauma, uh, poverty and disadvantage is a very big one, um, life stresses. These are all things that are quite difficult to control in many instances. So understanding that there are risk factors that are modifiable is actually very powerful. And so this, um, this slide represents really the research that we've done over the last decade, we and, and now others as well, that have shown over and over again that the quality of our diets matters to our risk for these common mental disorders, particularly depression. That's where most of the research is. And so what we see is across countries, across cultures and right across the lifespan from what mums eat during pregnancy right through to the other end of life, our diet quality, independent of things such as our poverty or income, education, very importantly, our body composition, our body weight has nothing to do with it, um, other health behaviours, our diet quality is linked to our risk for these common mental disorders, particularly depression. Now, this is a very busy slide, but it comes from this meta-analysis um, where we looked at all of these different dietary indices. So that would be whether it's a, a scale that measures our adherence to a Mediterranean style diet or a dietary inflammatory index, how much the, the food that we eat might be pro or anti-inflammatory. Um, you know, there's many different ways of measuring diet quality. But overall, they come up with roughly the same thing, that uh, when we look at people's diets, if they're healthier, the re risk for depression is reduced by roughly 30%. So that's very powerful. And there's been a number of meta-analyses that have shown this now. And there are also data, uh, although fewer data have looked at it, but um, there are also meta-analysis data telling us that unhealthy diets, so diets that are high in you know, all the foods that we know are not good for us, are linked to um, an increased risk for these common mental disorders. Now, as I mentioned, this is really important to understand from the point of view of prevention. Half of all mental disorders start before the age of 14. If we want to prevent, we need to be thinking about these modifiable risk factors in the first stages of life. And to this end, the It's important to note that these are two different constructs. So you have one thing which is not enough of the healthy food. So these are the foods that are high in plant fiber, uh, very important for your gut microbiome and for your immune system, um, high in polyphenols and, you know, basically the plant foods, healthy fats, um, good quality proteins such as fish. Uh, not having enough of these is linked to poor mental health. And also independently having too much of these sorts of foods, foods that are high in fats and added fats, salts, added sugars, refined carbohydrates, these are consistently linked to poor mental health quite independently of each other. And that's an important understanding that if you are having lots and lots of these healthy foods, but you're also having these, it's still a problem. And similarly, if you might not have many of these, but you don't have much of these, you're living on a, say, a white bread and you know, sausages, very limited diet, then that's also a problem. But we see this in adolescence. So this is just one study. This is a study um, from 2010, one of the first studies I led in this space, looking at more than 7,000 young Australians, 10 to 14 years from right across Australia, very wide range of socioeconomic backgrounds and showing that those who are lowest in those healthy foods had the highest scores on the adolescent um, uh, mental health questionnaire. And those with the highest intake of unhealthy foods also had the highest level. And again, these were different kids. So it's not just the inverse of each other. Now in this study, we took into account a very wide range of things such as family conflict, poor family management, family SES, 
kids' health, other health behaviours, all of these things. And we see these very clear dose-response relationships. And there's been many, many studies that have looked at this. And then we go right back to the start of life, um, and it will be very, very similar in the US and, and North America as it is in the UK as well, and increasingly right across the globe. In Australia, less than half a percent of children are eating the recommended intake of vegetables and legumes. Australian teenagers eat an average of seven serves of junk food a day. In the US, 60% of children who are alive today will be clinically obese by the age of 35. Now, this is a very serious problem for the next generation and the intergenerational transmission of disease because metabolic ill health during pregnancy, and that's for, for the fathers as well, um, induces risk for all sorts of physical and mental health outcomes in the children. This is another very nice meta-analysis uh, led by one of my students. Um, and we, she looked at all of the data. So we led a study in uh, 2013, I think, which was the first study to look at whether, we know that early life nutrition, so what happens in the womb, what happens in early life is important to the health outcomes of kids, you know, whether it's metabolic health, all sorts of other health outcomes. But this study looked at whether it was related to children's emotional health. So not just physical health, but emotional health. And what, what we looked at was 23,000 mothers and their children. And we looked at mother's diets during pregnancy, children's diets in first um, years of life. And then we modeled that against the trajectory of these uh, behaviors, internalizing and externalizing behaviors that we know are markers of vulnerability to mental health risk. And we saw these relationships, mother's diets during pregnancy, if they had more of these junk and processed foods, independent of a very wide range of other factors, was linked to children's high levels of these behaviours. And then independent of what mum ate, children's diets were also linked to these behaviours. Now, there's been a number of other studies, and that's what's summarised in this study. Um, where we see that mother's diets during pregnancy are linked to cognitive outcomes in the children uh, and externalising behaviours, not clearly linked to internalising behaviours, but also linked to socio-emotional behaviours. Now, it's important to know, I think this is really critical, these are not massive effect sizes. So no one's saying that if mothers eat junk food during pregnancy, their children are all going to have a mental disorder. I think that's really important. But it's just saying that this is one factor that we can modify that may, at the population level, influence um, a greater likelihood or tendency towards mental disorders. And it really goes back again to this conversation about the food environment. We should not be targeting individuals or blaming people. We need to be saying, how can we modify the food environment so it's not so toxic? So that every time we go to put petrol in our car or we walk down the street we're not being bombarded with opportunities and marketing to consume these ultra processed foods that have had millions spent on them designing them to interact with all the reward centers in our brain and then we put it out there and we market them heavily we make them very cheap we make them uber available uh, they become socially normalized and this is the food environment and this is what we need to change so we need food policy Okay. Now, when we go to the clinical trials, this is, of course, where we move from correlation, which can't prove causation, to clinical trials. And this is our fairly landmark study, the SMILES trial, which uh, looked at the potential of dietary improvement as a treatment strategy for major depressive disorder. Very simply speaking, people were randomised to receive either dietetic support for three months or social support for three months, which we already know is helpful for people with depression. The people who came into the study had moderate to severe clinical depression. So it wasn't just a bit miserable. They were actually quite unwell. They came into the study with poor diets to start with, lots of junk and processed foods, sweets, etc., etc., And with the dietetic support, they were supported to gradually make changes to their diets to reduce the intake of those sorts of foods and to increase the intake of plant foods, fish, healthy fats, legumes, etc. And what we saw was a very, very pronounced impact on their depressive symptoms, where in fact, a third of the people in the dietary group went on to have full remission of their depression, um, compared to only 8% in the social support group. 
So that study, of course, has been very, very influential and has um, kick-started a number of other clinical trials which have shown the same thing. I think what's really important to note with that study too, two important things. One, we did a uh, formal economic evaluation that showed that this was an incredibly cost-effective way to treat depression. There was an average cost saving of roughly 3,000 Australian dollars for each participant in the dietary group because they lost less time out of role and they saw other health practitioners less often. So what it's saying is if you take a dietary approach to supporting clinical depression, you're having an impact on the whole person, their functioning, their physical health as well. And we also showed, and this is very important, that um, the diet that we were advocating was actually cheaper than the junk food diet that people were eating when they came into the study. Now, this of course is in an Australian context. We see in uh, North America, in the US, that um, the food environment is so toxic and has been for so many decades now that it's actually far more difficult to access healthy foods um, and much more expensive as well. But in Australia, when you go to the um, supermarket, you can very easily get tinned fish, frozen vegetables, um, tinned beans, dried beans, what have you, that form the basis of a healthy diet without costing a lot of money. We also uh, did a meta-analysis where we looked at all of the randomized control trials where they had tested a dietary intervention uh, mainly for other purposes. So at this time of this um, meta-analysis, there was only one trial that had done it when people with depression, and that was our trial, our SMILES trial. But there are many other studies where they have tested a dietary intervention in other populations, whether it's people living with um, obesity, people living with another chronic condition, even healthy populations, but they just happen to have measured depression and anxiety. And from this meta-analysis, you can see that we concluded from all of the data that improving diet does improve mental health, does improve depression. There were fewer studies observed for anxiety um, but what we did see, and this is very consistent too, was that studies where they'd used a dietitian, like a clinical professional, then you did see positive benefits for anxiety. And I think this is critical, is that a nutrition professional helps people not only to understand what to eat, but how to get there, how to move their diet from this point to this point. And that's where you really see the benefits. So if you're ever you know, designing a clinical trial to look at this, you get a nutrition professional to deliver the intervention, not you know, uh, an RA or a, a psychologist, et cetera. Okay. So our Food and Mood Centre program, and I should say with all of that, so now we have more than a decade of very, very consistent evidence from the observational studies from right across the life course. We have, um, of course, there's huge a number of data from animal studies and experimental studies, which are great because you can chop the animal's heads off, look at their brains, all the rest of it. But of course, animals are not human. But we also have a growing evidence base from the randomized control trials, all pointing in the same direction, that what we eat is important to our mental and brain health. The Food and Mood Center, we, um, I set this up in 2017. It now comprises uh, more than 10 postdocs, myself and a an, uh, deputy director, associate professor, Adrian O'Neill. Um, and we have many, many PhD students and many research staff as well. And the program is unique in the world. We're the only research center in the world with a, a program of research um, focused on nutritional psychiatry. I'm the founder and president of the International Society for Nutritional Psychiatry Research. So I sort of lead this internationally. And the work that we do spans early life right through to healthy aging. We look at health behaviors and determinants, including social and economic determinants. We focus on mental and brain health. So as well as depression and anxiety, we look at psychosis, eating disorders, PTSD, cognition, neurobiology. We're also now looking at uh, multiple sclerosis and chronic fatigue syndrome. We look at physical health and that how that all intersects. So gut health, cardiovascular health, metabolic health, vascular health. We're looking at neurodegeneration, cognitive decline and dementia. Uh, and we have a big focus here on uh, early life as well. Uh, we span from mechanisms, so basic science, right through to implementation science in health services and education and training. So it's a very broad program and we're having a number of very important uh, impacts. 
So in terms of mechanistic pathways, when we think about how diet uh, may influence mental and brain health, the first uh, point, I guess, that I focused on earlier in my career was the immune system. Uh, inflammation, which is this low-grade chronic activation of the immune system and the related oxidative stress. Because when I came into psychiatry research, which was quite accidental, it was in the sort of early 2000s when we were starting to understand that the immune system was intricately um, involved in mental and brain health in a bi-directional manner. So our mental health very much influences our immune system, which also in turn influences our mental and brain health. And of course, diet has a very important impact on our immune function. Brain plasticity is the other. Around that time, neuroscientists had also twigged that there was, um, it wasn't the case that we were born with our full complement of brain cells and we only lost them across the life course. And that indeed there was this key region of the brain called the hippocampus that actually grows new neurons throughout life. And that key region of the, hip, uh, the brain, it uh, is very much involved in learning and memory, but also in mental health. And what we were seeing from the animal studies was that um, by manipulating diet, you could have a big impact on this brain plasticity. So BDNF is the protein that uh, one of the proteins, but a very important one that helps to grow the new neurons. Um, and if you feed animals um, a, a Western diet or a cafeteria diet, they get reductions in this and um, an impact on the hippocampus that's manifesting um, a reduced ability to do cognitive tasks, memory tasks. Um, and then uh, the opposite is also true. If you feed them, you know, polyphenols or omega-3 fatty acids or healthy fats, you see an increase in BDNF. And then of course the gut microbiota, which I'll talk a bit more about in a moment. So going back to BDNF and brain plasticity, this is a nice depiction of the hippocampus. And um, what I would say about this is that we led the first study that looked at this question in humans. So does uh, the quality of our diet relate to our the size of the hippocampus? And in this study, and I'm sorry, I don't have the, um, the citation there, but um, you can look it up. We looked at uh, an older cohort of people. And of course, as you age, your, your hippocampus gets smaller. And that, of course, then you tend to start losing your car keys and forgetting your kids' names and all of those sorts of things. Um, it's a bit depressing, really, this age-related shrinkage in the hippocampus. But what we saw was that, very simply speaking, even when we took into account all of these other very important factors, including depression, uh, people who had healthier diets had much larger hippocampus than those who had unhealthier diets. Uh, and this wasn't just a small effect. This was a really quite a large effect. Um, now, that has been shown subsequently in several much larger studies. So that's very important to understand that what is true in animals seems to also be true in humans. But this is where we're really focusing a lot of attention, this microbiota gut-brain axis. So we think about diet and its impact on mental health and the brain. And we think that um, in, uh, certainly in large part, it operates through the gut. And this whole area of gut microbiota research is, of course, very, uh, it's fascinating. It's quite revolutionary. It's really turning a lot of what we thought we knew on its head in, in medicine, which is very exciting because the thing about the, the microbiota is you can study it, although it's very complex, which I'll talk about in a moment, and you can modify it pretty quickly. So we have 100 trillion microorganisms that live on us and live um, within us. And we've co-evolved with them. So they can't live without us. We can't live without them. We've only started to understand this in the last 20 years or so as we've developed ways of measuring them through gene sequencing technology. Um, in fact, you know, more than 99% of our genetic material is actually bacterial. It's non-human. Uh, so we have many, many more microbial genes than we do human genes. When we think about the biological dysregulation that we see in depression, and this is uh, also true for other disorders such as psychosis, again, this uh, inflammation, this immune dysfunction and related oxidative stress with these sorts of biomarkers um, that are dysregulated in uh, mental disorders, we see metabolic dysregulation, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome that's both consequence of mental disorders, but also seems to be potentially causal. And certainly such as in the example of people with schizophrenia, there seem to be inbuilt problems with metabolism that go right back to early life. 
Uh, the stress response system, this HBA axis, uh, which is very intricately linked to the, to the gut. Um, and the neurotransmitters, neuropeptides, all of these are very much modified by the gut microbiota. But in addition, the gut microbiota, we now know also very much influences that brain plasticity and the, the integrity of the blood brain barrier and that um, hippocampal plasticity, you know, the shrinkage and the growth. Um, when we think about factors influencing the gut microbiota, there's many factors at the macro level. So where we live, the country we live in, but also whether we live in the city or live in the countryside, uh, the, the food that we eat and the way it's produced, whether or not we're exposed to animals in our environment. Um, obviously things such as smoking and drinking seem to influence the gut microbiome, sleep, uh, hygiene, um, disease factors, uh, aging, the drugs that we take, as I mentioned, the geography, our birth mode, whether we're born by caesarean or not, whether or not we were breastfed, exercise. But it seems that the most important factor, um, or at least one of the most important factors along with geography and drugs is our diet. And what we see is both our long-term and our short-term dietary habits influence the gut microbiota, both its composition and its function. So we do a huge amount of microbiome research uh, at the Food and Mood Centre, um, although because of the nascency of the Food and Mood Centre and the nascency of the field, a lot of those studies are only just starting to be published. There's many more to come. But we have um, a very strong focus on ensuring the best methodologies because it's a very, very complex area from a statistical point of view, from a gene sequencing point of view, from all sorts of... Um, the way you collect the stool, what you look at, the biomarkers, etc. We look a lot at the infant microbiome and neurodevelopment. We're looking at the oral microbiome and brain health, as well as the gut microbiome and its influence on cognition and Alzheimer's disease. And we do a lot of SciComm. Um, and this is true right across the life course. I'm just going to focus now on a few studies that we're doing at the Food and Mood Centre with the microbiome focus. It's important to note, though, we have more than 20 very large studies uh, underway at the Food and Mood Centre. About 15 of those involve the gut microbiome, but um, many of them don't. We've got a very large study looking at health services, and I'll talk a bit more about that at the end. Uh, but at this stage, I'll just take you through some of the studies that we're doing focused on the microbiome. And going back to the food environment, if we think about um, the diversity of our microbiome, how complex our bacteria were, that biodiversity of our own guts goes along with the biodiversity of the planet. And we know that that's going down the toilet, so to speak. And certainly as far as our food intake goes, when we were hunter gatherers, we had a very, very large and diverse range of foods that we took in from the environment. As we moved to agriculture and monocultures, it became less diverse. And then of course, we started to get these industrial processing of foods where it became less and less diverse. And people are having a far, far more narrow range of foods, which influences the biodiversity of our guts. And of course, very importantly, we're exposed to a huge amount of antibiotics, both in a clinical setting and through the food system. And in fact, more than 80% of antibiotics that are in use in the world are used in the food system to grow animals. And one of the major things that they use them for is to make animals fatter. So I just want you to think about that, uh, the impact of making animals fatter through antibiotics, and then we eat those animals and we get the antibiotics. And so what we have is a reduction, a very pronounced reduction in the diversity of our microbiota. And you can see this as people move from um, less developed economies where you have a more diverse plant-focused diet to the West, their microbiome becomes less and less diverse. And at the same time, we've seen this massive increase in immune-related disorders. So this is asthma, eczema, and hay fever, but we're also seeing autoimmune disorders such as type 1 diabetes and MS are going through the roof. And we think it's linked to this loss of diversity and loss of health of our microbiome because one of the really critical things that our early life microbiome, so this is our guts in the first days, weeks, months of life, it trains our immune system. So if we don't have a healthy gut microbiota in early life, we get this problem with our immune function and then that can manifest in all of these things. That is what the hypothesis is 
it's a difficult one to test and show because you need very long-term studies. They're underway now, but this is what uh, all of the data are pointing towards. But what they also do, what the early life gut microbiome also do is influence um, brain development. And we know this from, one of the ways we know this is from something called germ-free mice. This is where mice uh, or rodents are, are bred without a gut microbiome. And they have a very, very different brain. They have big changes in their behavior in their neurotransmitter systems, in their stress response systems, in their inflammation, in their brain plasticity, in their brain integrity. So we see this from a number of um, different sources of information that our early life gut microbiota influences not just our immune function, but our brain development. And of course, if you think about this, uh, where do we get our early life gut microbiome from? We would get it from our mums. So if our mums are not well, if our mums are eating a poor diet, which mostly they are, and if they're metabolically unhealthy, all of those things, it's likely that their gut microbiota is not that flash. And then that's what gets given to the kids. And then, of course, when they're exposed to antibiotics, because they're all having caesareans, being born by caesarean section, or in the first use of life, they're having ear infections and whatever, and they're being given antibiotics for these, we see this real issue with early life gut microbiota. Now, this is just one study that uh, one of my, uh, Dr. Amy Lofman heads up our microbiome research stream at the Food and Mood Center. This is an important study that was uh, published last year. And um, what they did was they looked at in a, in a cohort study. So this is mothers and their babies and they're following them over time. They looked at stool samples from the infants in the first um, months of life and then at the age of one and then looked at child behavior at two. So this again is this internalizing, externalizing construct, internalizing being, you know, sadness and crying and nightmares and anxiety, externalizing anger and tantrums and these sorts of things. These are linked to the vulnerability for mental health problems later on. And what they did was they looked at the, the composition, the bacterial composition of the gut microbiota in infancy and um, looked at that against the child behavior at age two. And what they found very simply was that um, in a particular bacteria called Prevotella copri, which we know is very strongly linked to fiber intake, um, we see that uh, the, in those with future behavioral problems, only 5% of them had this bacteria present at one year of age. Whereas it, nearly half of those who were emotionally didn't, not affected, uh, they had this. So this was a really, really interesting study. That particular Prevotella copra has also been linked to a, a lower incidence of um, asthma and uh, allergic disease in this same cohort. And we also have just had a new study just accepted last night for publication showing that mother's bacteria is linked to child emotional outcomes as well. And again, it seems to be linked to the mother's diet. Um, so going back to this idea of fiber, the, uh, there's many, many things that the gut bacteria do, but if we make it super, super simple, their primary job is to break down food components that we can't break down ourselves. So to, we don't have the enzymes to break down these complex carbohydrate fibers. Um, and this is a bit of a misleading picture, I have to say, because fruits and vegetables like this contain, uh, you know, certain types of fiber, but actually they're not necessarily the ones that are fermentable and that are used by the gut microbiota. But the gut microbiota break down plant fibers. And in doing so, they release many, many molecules. They break them down through a process of fermentation the molecules they produce in this process, including short chain fatty acids, have a profound impact throughout the body. They very much influence our metabolism, our glucose insulin systems, our body weight. They influence our immune function. In fact, something like 70% of our immune function is located in the gut. Uh, they very much influence our stress response system because the brain and the gut are tightly linked via the vagus nerve as well. Uh, they influence the way our genes express themselves. Right throughout the body, we have receptors on our cells that these short chain fatty acids link into and affect the way our genes express themselves. They affect the integrity of our blood brain barrier uh, and brain plasticity. So 
the molecules that are produced during the degradation of plant fiber influence all of these key functions throughout the body. Of course, what happens when we don't eat fiber? There's nothing for the gut bacteria to live on. They die, they become extinct. We know from animal studies that you, after four generations of low fiber diets, such as what you see in the US, you cannot get back those bacteria without, um, well, in the animal studies, they use an FMT, a fecal microbial transplant, but also potentially uh, probiotics, but it's a bit more complex than that. So our modern food environment, you know, being aware again that less than half a percent of children eat their recommended dietary intake of vegetables and legumes, which is a primary source of fiber, uh, is really problematic. So whole grain cereals have particular types of fiber that the, the gut bacteria um, are very much optimized to consume, legumes, nuts and seeds, and we're not having anywhere near enough of these. So this is another study that we're just about to submit the main findings for. This was a randomized control trial that we did at our big Royal Children's Hospital. And this was aimed at improving the diets of mothers during pregnancy with the aim of seeing whether we could influence the gut microbiota of the infants. Because again, we're getting back to this idea, how do we make sure that kids have the best start to life to reduce the likelihood that they'll go on to develop physical and mental health problems? And we know that in Australia, as in the wider population, fewer than 10% of women who are pregnant eat according to the dietary guidelines. And the basic dietary guidelines, they're just very simple. So, you know, um, three veg, uh, two, sorry, two fruits, five veg, um, you know, having whole grain cereals rather than refined carbohydrates, avoiding uh, many of the discretionary foods, et cetera, et cetera. So in this study, uh, we wanted to see whether an educational dietary program that targeted the gut microbiota during the third trimester of pregnancy, A, whether it helped women to improve their diets, and B, whether it resulted in any differences in the gut microbiota in mothers and their infants four weeks after birth. And um, the dietary workshop was just three and a half hours at this particular stage of pregnancy well, women were taught about the prebiotic foods, which is the foods that feed the gut microbiota, such as legumes and uh, onions and um, whole grain cereals, etc. But also the probiotic foods, things like yogurt and um, kefir and kimchi and kombucha and these sorts of things where the fermentation has already been done by the bacteria. And uh, we, what we found was that, and we've just published this actually, was A, the program did help pregnant women to improve their diet quality and the intake of these sorts of foods. And the study, the results paper, which we're literally about to submit uh, by the end of this week, shows that it did have an impact on the infant gut microbiota. The infants whose mums had this dietary intervention had different gut microbiota to those who didn't. And the mums also had differences in their microbiota. So this is an important proof of concept study. We need to do it much larger and for much longer term to see what it means. But it does say uh, that what we thought would be true does seem to be true. What mothers eat during pregnancy does seem to influence the gut microbiota of the infants. This is another study uh, that we're just um, about to submit the ethics application for. So this is an FMT study. So this is taking people with um, moderate to severe clinical depression and actually doing a fecal microbial transplant. So we take stool from people who are very healthy, mm -hmm. who, um, you know, they have to be really super healthy. Only about 3% of people qualify to, you know, to be super poo donors, but they um, uh, it must be free, of course, of mental disorder, but also um, their body weight must be within the, the BMI range that we would hope for. They don't have other health conditions, they eat a healthy diet, all of these sorts of things. And um, at this point, we're actually not going to do 60. We're actually going to do a smaller number in this uh, second part of the year, and it will be delivered um, by Enema. So we were going to use Crapsules, but for various reasons related to the TGA, which is like the FDA in the US, uh, we are having to move things around because um, we found that COVID was transmitted through stool. So there's all these things that have had to happen to make sure that the stool that we give people doesn't have COVID and doesn't have any other nasty things. But basically what we'll be doing is looking at the feasibility of an enema delivered FMT and then looking at whether the FMT changes things such as the faecal microbiome, obviously, but all of these other aspects of functioning that we think are related to 
uh, mental health. So that study will get underway hopefully in about three months time. This is another one, um, our very uh, well-known SMILES trial that I mentioned uh, earlier, the randomized control trial showing that if you help people to improve the quality of their diet, it results in a very substantial benefit to their mental health. Um, what we've done is spent the last three and a half years developing and testing a digital version of this app, uh, of this program. And the, um, the randomized control trial, in fact, it will be slightly more than that 800 and something, but it will be a, an international trial all done digitally, where we look at um, people randomized to one of two forms of a nutrition education program. And then we'll look at their mental health. We'll look at markers of gut function, including their stool samples. We'll look obviously at their diet quality and what changed um, and a, a number of other parameters. So we hope to start that later this year. Uh, we're applying for funding, of course, to do the, the actual trial itself, but uh, all the things are in place. But in this one, we'll actually probably be collecting more stool samples than this. So we'll be looking at um, whether the microbiome changes in, in you know, from changing your dietary behaviours and whether that correlates with changes in mental health. We're doing a huge amount in the translation space. And when I wrote this particular presentation, um, we hadn't had the outcomes of the, what we've had is a huge productivity commission mental health report in Australia. We made a submission to that um, commission and on the basis of that, they've included diet as well as exercise as individual risk factors and treatment targets for mental disorders. So that's very important because it's recognized in a you know, policy document from the government. But what's happened even more recently that's probably more important is our Royal Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatry clinical practice guidelines for the treatment of mood disorders has now for the first time in the world put what is essentially lifestyle medicine as the foundational step. And they've said it's non-negotiable. Before you do anything else, if you're a psychiatrist and you have a patient with a mood disorder, you look at their diet quality, their exercise behaviours, their sleep, and their smoking use and other substances, of course. So those four, you do that first, and then you move on to other treatments. And this is really important because it's for the first time recognising the fundamentals of those it's the first time, if you think about psychiatry, it's traditionally not paid much attention to anything that happened below the neck, as if what happened below the neck was separate to what happened in the brain. Now we now know that that's completely untrue, that we're one fully integrated, highly complex system where all of those factors I mentioned before, our stress response system, our gut, our immune system, our um, metabolic system, they're all intricately linked to our mental and brain health, as well as our physical health. And that means that the underlying drivers of all those systems, which is diet, exercise, sleep, not smoking, these are the petrol that drives every single aspect of our health. And we target them first, and then we can lay on other treatments after that if they're needed. But of course, there's a huge gap between what might be recommended in the clinical guidelines and what actually happens in clinical practice. And the main reason for that at the moment is a lack of training. Around the world, people who um, go through medical school, even though poor diet is the leading cause of illness and early death around the world, they'll often receive as little as two hours of training in nutrition through their whole medical degree. And this is where I want you to be incredibly careful when you see high profile psychiatrists, particularly in North America, coming out with statements about diet and what people should and shouldn't eat. They are not evidence-based. They do not have the training. They do not have the knowledge that they need to make these recommendations. And unfortunately, they're promoting a lot of non-evidence-based, potentially very dangerous ideas. So keep that in mind. But the point is that we need to educate medical practitioners, including psychiatrists. We need to remove structural barriers around reimbursement. There's a whole lot of things we have to do. One of the things we did was to uh, set up a, a joint World Federation Societies of Biological Psychiatry and the Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine International Task Force to develop clinical guidelines for lifestyle medicine and mental health treatment. First of those uh, will be published this year in Depression, but they aim to give very detailed information to physicians uh, to guide their treatment. 
We've also started um, to do education around nutritional psychiatry. So our food and mood course, uh, which is aimed at the general public, so it's very lay, it's pretty basic, but that we first ran that in 2019 and that has now attracted nearly 65,000 students from around the world, from more than 170 countries, which just speaks to the interest in this particular topic. And we are now working with the um, various big health bodies to divide, de design accredited training for health practitioners. So that's just some of the things that we're doing. The take home message is that diet matters to mental and brain health, just as it does to physical health. It's modifiable, therefore it's an excellent target for prevention and treatment. If you wanna know more, there's a book uh, that I published um, 2019 that gives you a bit of an overview, uh, although it's nearly two years out of date now, but it still gives you a really good basis for the field and the science. And this is one that um, I published with my husband far more recently that has been very, very popular and will hopefully go onto the school curriculum. The idea being that you make it very concrete, very simple for people and for kids to make good food choices that helps their physical and uh, mental health. Um, this is, we've got, this is a bit out of date as well. It's much larger now, but uh, our, our team is growing all the time. And you can of course go to the Food and Mood Centre website to find out more. So thank you very much. And I'm very happy to answer questions for people. Great, thank you so much. If anybody wants to chime in or put them in the chat, um, feel free to just hop I into the conversation. So, I have so many questions. My name is <laughs> Nina Moreau. Thank you so much for this really incredible talk. So thorough and um, I'm so impressed by how prolific your science is, how much you've done in such a short period of time. I have lots of questions, but I'm gonna put them in the chat um, so that they'll, oops, hopefully that just worked. Yes, just so that it'll be clearer. And um, I'll just mute myself and take your comments. Thank you so much. I can't, oh, here we go, okay. What we eat, but how we eat. Yeah, intermittent fasting, time-restricted feeding. Yeah, these don't seem to matter a lot so far. And I have to say, we haven't done um, any, there's no research yet on intermittent fasting and time-restricted feeding on mental health. Um, we do see in the animal studies that it seems to have an impact, but when we translate that to human studies, it doesn't seem to have much of an impact. Certainly doesn't have much of an effect on weight loss. Um, number of calories doesn't seem to come into it. What we know is that people with a mental disorder will be more likely to put on weight around their stomach because of the glucocorticoids, the stress response hormones, and that um, truncal fat may also feed into depression as it does into other chronic diseases because of the immune factors, these cytokines that come out of the body fat. But I think it's incredibly important to note that the links that we see between depression, uh, between diet quality and mental health are completely independent of body composition. It just does not come into the equation. And in our SMILES trial and in other studies, when you improve diet quality, you get a very profound impact on mental health with no change in body weight. So forget about body weight, forget about your body size, focus on diet quality, which is something you can change. Body size is very difficult, to, to, it's very strongly genetic. Within a food environment where everyone has unlimited access to food, uh, it's not realistic that people are going to be lean, it's just not gonna happen. So you forget about that, focus on diet quality. Uh, supplementing the diet with pre and probiotics. Yeah, of course, there's a move in the US to take these as supplements because they love something that's easy. It's a quick fix. We, there are, all the data tell us that there is no benefit to taking prebiotics as a supplement. There's some benefit to taking probiotics as a supplement, uh, particularly in those with quite severe clinical depression. But you cannot just do that and not fix the diet because then the bacteria, they've got nothing to eat. They just disappear, it's pointless. You've got to have the dietary substrates for the bacteria to eat. This is why these keto diets and everything are just such a bloody disaster because it's doing the absolute opposite of what you would hope for a healthy gut. Top three recommendations for people with regards to diets, very simple, uh, many more plant foods. And so that's you know fruits, vegetables, whole grain cereals, uh, nuts and seeds, legumes, very important. Very hard to get your fibre enough fibre without legumes. You can have legume pasta. You, you know, there's many ways to have legumes. Um, but then the second is diversity. 
diversity of your plant foods means more diversity, biodiversity of your gut. And that seems to be a healthy thing. And the third thing, of course, is as much as possible, avoid ultra processed foods. All of the aspects of them, the refined carbohydrates and sugars, the salts, the added fats, uh, the emulsifiers, the artificial sugars, each of these have been shown to have a really negative impact on the gut and the brain, and they're very closely related to poor mental health. Um, and I would probably throw in there too, if you can have some fermented foods. So start adding those into your diet. It's a good source of, of uh, often the bacteria themselves, but it's the fermentation products that are really important, like the short chain fatty acids and things. Um, is there anything the gut microbiota is not linked to? Well, it's a good question because, of course, they are very much part of us. As you see, most of our genes are actually microbial. So anything that we do is, will be reflected in the gut microbiota and they influence so many aspects of our physiology. Um, but there may also be direct pathways, for example, between food and the brain uh, that relate to brain plasticity that aren't part of what the gut is doing, um, but we don't have enough information yet to, to know that fully. Uh, juicing in the diet. Look, you'll get some polyphenols, which is good. But of course, when you juice, you take away the fiber or you macerate the fiber, which means that the fiber is not then available for the gut microbiota to eat. So far, far better to eat the, the fruits and vegetables and not macerate them in a juice. Uh, organic versus non-organic. Um, look, there's very, very little information on that. Um, and the information that is there, the science that is there tells us that there's not the major difference that people would imagine. And if you have uh, a population where less than 1% of kids are eating the recommended intake of vegetables and, and legumes, then worrying about whether or not it's organic is just a furphy. That's, a, that's a, something for very privileged people uh, to worry about if they're in the very fortunate position of being able to make those sorts of choices. I think we need to focus much more on the, the majority of the population that's not eating these foods in the first place, whether organic or non-organic. Uh, can you be vegetarian, vegan and still have a quality diet? Yes, you can. You just have to pay attention to making sure that you're getting your um, long chain omega-3 fatty acids are very important. A lot of vegans have mussels and oysters because they don't have a central nervous system. And they are very important sources of uh, these long chain omega-3 fatty acids that are very important for your brain, as well as uh, many other aspects of your diet. Um, but also uh, obviously your B12 and your zinc and things that you get from animal foods. Uh, so you need to be pretty conscious of what you're eating um, when you're a vegetarian or a vegan. I'm a vegetarian um, for environmental and ethical reasons, more so than health reasons. From the research point of view, it looks like um, two to three small palm-sized serves of good quality red meat per week seem to be linked to better mental health. And I think for women who are menstruating, that is probably really important if you can. Uh, but that's not processed meats like sausages and ham and things like that. That's good quality red meat, just small amounts. Um, can gut microbiota also affect things like chronic migraine? Um, yeah, I would say so. I'm not sure whether there's been research done yet on migraine, but I would absolutely think so. Uh, the gut microbiota is very closely tied to liver function, which is closely tied to migraines and things like that. Uh, is there a link to the quality of mental health, not only poor diet, socioeconomic factors? Yep. Uh, so of course, people who have less access to education and income, uh, will often have a much more poor quality diet. Um, in the US in particular, where you have these food deserts and where it's incredibly hard to access just basic fresh food um, and it's very expensive, then, you know, you eat just crazy, even expecting people to be able to eat well. Where do you even start when you've had generations who've never understood how to prepare or buy fresh food? I mean, it, it's just such a disaster. You know, retrofitting that is going to be a major, major thing. Um, but what we do do in all of our studies is we take into account very detailed measures of socioeconomic status. And so whilst people who are less advantaged will have poorer diet and will also be more inclined to have poor mental health, that doesn't explain the link we see between diet quality and mental health. And we've looked at this in great detail over many cohorts across many countries. So yes, it comes into play, but it is not the reason for the, the links that we see. Uh, what's the first step to educating the general public? 
I think one of the first things we need to do is totally get away from this idea that everything around diet is related to our body composition and obesity. That has been a disaster because most people cannot lose or keep off body weight for a whole range of very complex reasons. So when they think that the only reason they should eat well is to have a lean body and then they can't, they give up. And what we would say is and everything we know, shitty diet is a really profound risk factor for mental and physical health, regardless of your body size. Focus on diet quality. And I think if you get that message out, that will go some way towards helping things. Uh, of course, we need public policy. Uh, size of our meal portions to mental health, I think it's probably irrelevant. It's not been looked at that, but it's much more around the quality rather than the quantity. Um, down here, are there new programs your centre is delivering directly to New Zealand and, and Australian children, school counsellors and educators? Uh, not yet, but we will hopefully be doing that over the next two years. Uh, do cultures that are considered to be happier despite being less developed in the traditional sense tend to have more plant-based quality diets? Yes. Traditional diets all around the world are much more plant-based and, you know, they, they do have, uh, when they do have animal proteins, they're good quality ones. They're not raised on feedlots and, and with lots of antibiotics and things like that. Um, and they tend to be more diverse as well. And all of them, whether it's a traditional Norwegian diet, a traditional Japanese, traditional Chinese, whatever, they're all linked to better mental health outcomes. Um, <clears throat> so the takeaway message is that your diet really matters. Forget about your body size. Just focus on feeding your gut. Make it, It's very concrete. You know what you eat will affect your gut microbiome within hours. So feed your gut microbiome. Feed your I gut. Have, I have one more question thinking about... Um... I always get this question, it's a pushback in the research in this area is, you know, this bi-directional relationship between nutrition and mental health. Mm -hmm. And I've heard you speak before sort of pushing back on that. It's not all that bi-directional. And I, I'm hoping you can speak to that a little bit again. So you, you, we think that this is a, a, a truism and something that is well established that people with more poor mental health have a, an unhealthier diet. Now that's true to some extent, but the relationship is not nearly as strong as people might think. Similarly, people think that diet quality is very strongly linked to body size, it's not. Um, but we've done very explicit and very extensive research on this. And one of the things we do is say, for example, if you're doing a prospective observational study where you've got a starting point, you measure everyone's diet, you measure their mental health, you take out everyone who's already got a mental health problem and then you follow them over time and see who develops a new uh, you know, for the first time mental disorder. And from all of those many, many studies, we see that diet predicts mental health, not the other way around. We've looked at it very closely in ongoing cohort studies and looked at the direction. What we find actually is really interestingly that people who've had previous depression actually often eat better than people who don't. Uh, and that's probably because maybe instinctively they understand that there's a relationship between their health behaviours and their mental health. Um, so that reverse causality does not seem to be the explanation for what we see. Uh, just going back to the chat now, do which fatty food is your biggest obstacle? Personally, <laughs> oh, that's easy. Chips, uh, sorry, not chips, cheese, milk fat. <laughs> I just love blue cheese. I can't have it in the house. I would eat it. A whole slab. I love the stuff. So that's my um, my weakness. I don't. I'm not particularly interested in any of the others. Maybe hot chips every now and again if someone sticks them on the table. But um, yeah, fatty food. Anything to do with uh, dairy fat. I love cream, ice cream, cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is cheese what keeps you from being vegan? No, I, I don't. Uh, my interest, my choice to um, not eat meat in general is based largely on ethical environmental choices, but I could do a lot better. I think from an environmental and ethical point of view, veganism is really the only defensible diet, but I also uh, recognise it as being probably not the best for human health 
um, you do need some of those animal foods and animal proteins. I'm very aware of the zinc and the B group vitamins and the long chain omega-3 fatty acids. And there's a lot of other components too that are not captured in just looking at those individual nutrients that you get in animal foods. If I was to be vegan, I would certainly be including oysters and, and mussels for the reasons that I mentioned. Um, and yes, I would probably find it very difficult to not, not have cheese and eggs as well. You know, I do eat eggs. Uh, I mentioned that geography is just important, diet and mental health, cultural dietary differences. Um, it is, it, it, when we look, no, the diet in, in, not in mental health, it's in gut health. So geography seems to be very important to your gut health. Uh, and people coming from traditional um, cultures will usually have a much more diverse diet. They will have many more plants in their diet, but they will also be exposed to soil and animals very commonly, and they will also not be exposed to Western ultra-processed foods. So that's the key thing. So it just is a beautiful example. There was a study done. So there's been a lot of studies that have looked at the gut microbiome of people, say, living traditional African lifestyles and those compared to in the West, and they see a huge difference in their diets and their gut microbiota composition. And one study did that, they looked at um, rural South Africans living a very traditional lifestyle in rural South Africa. And then they looked at African Americans eating a, a SAD, which is the um, standard American diet. Uh, and they saw that those with the SAD, the African Americans had a very um, less healthy diet, much more animal proteins and fats, much less fiber and plant foods, much less diversity. They had uh, a much less diverse and healthy microbiome and they had much greater levels of an inflammatory marker that's indicative of risk for bowel cancer and compared to the, African uh, the traditional South Africans. And then the poor things, they swapped their diets for two weeks. And what happened was in just that two week period, the South Africans their diet quality went right down, of course, their microbiota diversity and health went down and the inflammatory markers went up, whereas the opposite happened in the African-Americans. So you can affect a huge change just within two weeks, but it's probably not only dietary, it's exposure to soil and animals, farms, et cetera, that also influences the diversity of our gut. Uh, yes, uh, cheese problematic to the gut microbiome. <laughs> Saturated fat does seem to be not enjoyed by the gut microbiome. So, you know, that's why I don't have it in the house and I have it as a sometimes food <laughs> because saturated fat just seems to be, it's very pro-inflammatory. It seems to um, have a number of impacts and, and the, the gut and your brain, all aspects of your physiology don't like saturated fat. Uh, your work targets the challenges we face with body dysmorphia. Yeah, and this is, I don't know if any of you follow me on Twitter, but I tweeted something just a couple of days ago. I just think the public health messaging around diet um, and its focus on obesity has just been absolutely stigmatizing, counterproductive and completely unhelpful. Uh, what are your opinions on taking probiotic supplements? I look, you can do a bit of both. I, I do take probiotic supplements. Um, and but I also take a lot of fermented foods. So you, you're covering all your bases, basically. Um, uh, you, you can't just do one and not the other, I think. And what you need to do, of course, is provide the food for the bacteria to eat, which is those plant fibers and that sort of thing. How quickly can the gut microbiome be changed for the better? Well, as I said, within two weeks, they saw very, very profound changes. Uh, and there's other studies that have shown within five days, very profound changes. So you can probably change it within hours. Certainly, as re regards to mental health, our study, our SMILES trial went for three months and we saw big, big changes. Uh, but another more recent study just looked at it for three weeks in young people and saw very large changes within three weeks. So it seems to work pretty fast. In terms of the, the full fat dairy, um, thinking about the other types of fats that are in dairy, I've, I have seen, and this is an these studies weren't looking at mental health at all, but looking at microbiota and showing some benefits of some other types of fatty acids that we don't really get from any other foods. Well, I don't know about any, but we get them mostly from whole. Dairy. Yeah, like conjugated linoleic acid yeah. and things like that. No, that's true. So there's, you know, with, with dairy foods, we've done quite a lot of work looking at dairy foods and their relationship to mental health. And it seems it's very equivocal. Um, 
you know, it, it, some studies have shown positive relationships, some have shown negative. It very probably depends on the, the quality of the dairy product. I mean, if you're getting your dairy products through ice cream and sweetened yogurts, that's not going to be great. But if you're getting it through um, natural yogurts, which is fantastic because it's a fermented product, if you're getting it through um, good quality cheeses in moderate amounts, I think it, it's probably fine. Um, I do drink milk. Um, I mix it up with other sorts of non-milk, you know, soy or whatever. Uh, and I do eat cheese. As I said, I, I choose low fat cheese, mainly ricotta cheese and cottage cheese and things like that. Uh, but I do have some full fat dairy as well. I think, you know, a, a, a sensible diet is one that just focuses on non super processed foods, ultra processed foods. And so it has diversity. So you can have dairy, you can have a bit of meat, you can have, I, I eat fish uh, and seafood and obviously a full range of plant foods. And being too worried and too obsessed, and this is my issue a lot of the time with veganism, is that it feeds into what's called orthorexia, which is a very serious eating disorder, which is increasingly common, where people just get so over-obsessed with what they're eating and they, they cut out more and more and more foods and their diet gets much more narrow and less and less diverse, and they ended up with a full-scale eating disorder, and it's uh, very, very problematic. So um, I still eat ice cream on a Friday. I still eat dark chocolate. I have treats. I have, you know, um, but what I wouldn't eat is like things that are ultra processed. You know, I just avoid them like the plague. I don't need them and they're just um, rubbish. They're just there like cigarettes to make profits for big business at the expense of our health. Uh, fish oil supplements. Yeah, no, I would never. Um, to promote those, they tend to oxidize, which is means that they're probably worse for you rather than better. Just eat a tin of good quality sardines. I have a tin of sardines in olive oil on a piece of toast for breakfast a couple of times a week. Great source of long chain omega-3 fatty acids. Um, but fish in light of industrial overfishing, ecological, absolutely couldn't agree more that uh, overfishing is a massive issue. Um, documentaries, I'd be very, very cautious about. The amount of misinformation on Netflix is just stunning. Um, you know, the and again, it's coming from these influencers and these, um, so for example, in my field, psychiatrists who are not trained in research, they don't know how to interpret research data, they don't understand it, and they promote all sorts of misinformation that's potentially very damaging. Um, there's many documentaries. They just cherry pick the bits of information they want uh, and, you know, uh, can make a very compelling story. And so I don't even watch them. You just don't look at them because they are designed to convince you of a particular thing. And they do that by being very clever about how they present the information. Uh, resting the gut. Yeah, look, I think, you know, we're designed to have a period overnight where we're not eating. Uh, so that 12 hour window, I think where you go, you know, with maybe 8 p.m., kitchen's closed, nothing else. And then you don't eat again until 8 a.m. the next morning. That's a pretty good strategy, I think. Um, we don't really know, though, whether that's true for, you know, we, it's not necessarily backed up by scientific information from human studies as yet, mainly from animal studies, which we have to be a bit careful about. Uh, <laughs> Someone had an eating disorder for an extended period of time. I think that's a really interesting question. We're actually doing a big research study looking at the microbiome and eating disorders because when people have, say, for example, severe anorexia nervosa, they go into um, a clinical setting, um, usually inpatient, and often that strate the strategy is to refeed them and get their body weight up very quickly. But in doing so, we think that some of those dietary strategies are going to be doing uh, harm to the gut because they are often very high sugar and high fat, which the gut will not enjoy. So if you're trying to, if you, if you know that the gut is intrinsically linked to your mental health, um, what you would want to be doing is feeding people with anorexia a diet that really is very, very good for their gut with the aim of improving their psychiatric symptoms and their gut health and this is where we're doing a lot of research um, eating disorders I would say that there are probably very severe repercussions for the gut that doesn't mean that they can't be helped uh, I think FMT is going to be an increasingly important clinical strategy 
although we very strongly urge people not to do it yourself at home. Um, uh, but we need to do the research to know for sure. Um, coffee. Oh, coffee's great. Well, you know, for people who are tending towards anxiety, they will usually self-limit coffee for obvious reasons. But coffee has a lot of polyphenols in it, which is good, particularly in the US diet. It's so low in polyphenols that apparently coffee is one of the major sources of polyphenols in their diet, which is just so sad. But anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah, I know I couldn't live without coffee either. <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much we're over our time we appreciate you staying and hanging out with us and answering our questions this was a great presentation um i know i've learned a lot and a lot to think about and go back and look at again probably <laughs> um so thank you again and this um you know nvu was so happy to have you also the vermont biomedical research network um was part of this um bringing you to campus as well so we want to thank them and thank everybody for your participation and being here tonight and uh take care thank you very much thank great you. pleasure thanks so for much. having me <laughs> thank you thanks so much uh, thanks everybody Thank you.